What is up, guys? It is the Blue Bloods here coming back at y'all with another episode of the Two Minute Drill. It is Wednesday, May fifth. Man, I cannot believe we're already in May, halfway through the re- halfway through the week. So stay, you know, stick it out, man. Almost to the amazing weekend we have ahead, but we have a a topic that I didn't want to do because. I feel uh, uh, it's, it's disappointing. So it's a topic that makes me kind of upset. It's a topic that I think not a lot of people are covering outside of the podcast, the, the YouTube channels, everything that do cover HBCU football. And I have really felt like it was my, I, I, my prerogative to cover this storyline, to talk about this issue that we're facing right now, especially with the NFL draft just wrapping up this weekend. So let's get right into it. And the storylines all today, you just saw it on our intro, is that no HBCU players were drafted this weekend in the 2021 NFL draft. Deion Sanders and multiple other coaches were vocally critical about the fact that None, no, no HBCU athletes were taken. There were a few that were signed to un, as undrafted free agents. We'll get to those. But Sanders himself said on Instagram, and quote, and we have the audacity to hate on one another while our kids are being neglected and rejected. I witnessed a multitude of kids that we played against that were more than qualified to be drafted. My players are... My, my prayers are that this won't ever happen again. Get your get your knife out my back and fight with me, not against me. I'm assuming that has to do with kind of some of the verbal back and forth that we saw between some of the SWAT coaches, probably particularly Connell Maynard and him, who had a pretty public back and forth after their game about four and five star kids or whatever. And even outside the SWAT, Sam Washington for North Carolina a and said, quote, you can go back as far as you like. Jerry Rice to Tariq Cohen, the quality of athlete is definitely not is definitely within our league. Them being seen or not being seen, it happened. For what reasons, I have not figured that part out, but the fact is that it happened speaking about that, you know, they made it in the NFL and that there were no players drafted this weekend. So just to give you all a brief history, so we're working with all the facts on this episode, Last year, only one player was drafted and was picked 227 offensive tackle Lachavius Simmons out of Tennessee State. The year before 2019 was a pretty good year. Four HBCU players drafted that included Titus Howard out of Alabama State, who became the first HBCU player since 2008 to be a first round pick. So, you know, I know this. Uh, so I want to put out two statements before we you know, get into the bulk of the episode. So I know this might be an issue some of our listeners may not understand. I'm talking to the Power 5 only football fans. They don't watch HBCU football. They don't, they don't know anything about it. I understand that this might not be your forte, what you tune in to see here on the Blue Bloods. But I want to use our platform to bring attention to these issues because while I may not – be suffering from these same issues that we see in our country, but my voice and our coverage here on the Blue Bloods could bring the eyes and ears of someone who has the power to change something. So I feel like it's my duty. And I know I already want to head off some backlash that I know I could get from some people who don't think this is a problem. I understand that some of these prospects that I'm going to mention later in the show may be bust. They may never pan out, but that's not the issue because I promise you 60, 70 percent of these picks aren't going to pan out for some of these prospects and meet those expectations set set out for them. But I just want to say this. This is my opening statement. You cannot tell me that one of these players I'm about to cover as some of the top prospects in HBCU was not one of the top 259 players this past weekend. You can't. As you know, we've kind of been shifting our covers more toward the HBCUs. We've been covering the SWAT football all all offseason, and we're expanding to a wider range of schools coming come this fall. I just don't see how you could say, you know, the level of talent isn't there because it is, and I'm telling you that. So given all that, man, 
let's get into the four prospects that were signed as undrafted free agents this weekend. And that it, it starts out with David Moore signed with the signed with the Panthers offensive lineman out of Grambling State. Calvin Ashley, uh, Auburn transfer down there, Florida A and M. He was signed by the Buccaneers. Mac McCain um, to the Broncos, and Brian Mills to the Seahawks. Um, but apparently, according to NFL scouts and their decision making, these guys were not worth a pick in the draft. So I want to start there, man, because for me, the most confusing thing for me is grambling offensive lineman David Moore. And before you say, oh, man, you're just being biased, you don't understand this, this, or this, he had a fourth-round grade, guys, from pro football focus going into draft weekend, but wound up not being drafted. This is a kid who we covered at the Senior Bowl because we cover that every year. Moore went to, went to the Senior Bowl, and I, I went back from some of the data that we were given since we covered it, and I looked at the grades and the breakdowns of his 1v1s from the week against some of the top D-line prospects. And so I took his grades, his 1v, his breakdowns of his 1v1s, and compared them to some of the other offensive linemen that were there that were drafted this weekend. Um, Moore had a higher overall grade for the week and a higher win rate in practices and 1v1s than Alex Leatherwood from Alabama, first round pick, pick 17 for the uh, uh, Las Vegas Raiders, a higher one than the star of the senior bowl, Quinn Meneres, out of Wisconsin, Whitewater, was drafted. Creed Humphrey, second round pick, I believe, out of Oklahoma Center. Aaron Banks drafted a late round prospect, but a lot of people think he could be a steal in the later rounds. Deontay Brown from Alabama, the, the mountain man, everyone was saying, like, look how big he is, look how physical. Yeah. David Moore outperformed him by a mile. And Drake Jackson, one of the more interesting prospects out of Kentucky, which I also was believed to be drafted, but also received a lot of hype going into this year. And so you're saying, okay, Zach, you gave me all those stats, but you know that's just one weekend. Yeah, I agree. It's just one weekend, but you don't think that warrants someone to take a waiver and a pick on a prospect like that? This guy is a pro- – so David Moore – did not allow a sack in his career. He only allowed two hits on the quarterback, only allowed three pressures his whole career, guys. Um, yeah, I get it. His height might not be great. It's like 6'1", 6'2", but that works for an inside lineman where he worked a lot of his time in college at guard. That's what he's going to play in the NFL. He was in the 91st percentile in weight. 84th percentile in arm length, 88th percentile in bench press compared to the other top prospects. So you're telling me if I give, if I take the name, I take the school off and I say David Moore, Alabama guard. Um, I'm waiting guys. Is, is that, is that someone you think is going to be drafted? Because I do. And, you know, listen, I want to say this. I get it. More might, more might not be a day one starter. Yes, if you draft him in the four or fifth, even I think people would have been fine with six rounds. You can't tell me that he didn't he didn't possibly deserve a waiver, a draft pick being used on him. And I think he could be a guy that you see sit for the first few years of his career, add some, get some added depth, be put into goal line situations, work on field goal, uh, kicks, stuff like that. But uh, I think he could be a veteran guy where you're like, okay, 10 years down the line, he's a 10-year veteran. He's starting. He can he can come in and do some stuff. I mean, I'm not asking him to be a Pro Bowl legendary Hall of Fame offensive lineman, but I think he was better than an undrafted free agents. And I know some people are going to say, oh, well, at least he got on an NFL contract. That's not the point. The difference between an undrafted free agent and being drafted in the fourth round is tremendous and that's money that's guaranteed at, at getting a real contract that that's probably not having to fight for your life in um summer camps and trying to fight to make that 53 man roster 
it's different. And I really, really hate how some people are being so nonchalant and not covering this issue, which is why I felt so passionately that we needed to cover it here on the Blue Bloods. Um, so I think Moore was the most obvious, blatant, like how did he not get drafted? And so this next guy I thought was probably going to be a sixth, seventh round guy. I'll be honest. We covered him with the Senior Bowl too. Brian Mills, North Carolina Central talent. He probably, you know, for me was a late round guy. I get it. A little raw. But he's a guy that a team should have probably taken a waiver on in the later rounds. He signed, ended up signing with the Seahawks, and I think that's a perfect fit. They need that long, rangy depth at corner. So I think it could be a perfect, perfect fit for the Seahawks there. So I think it's I think it could work out for him in the long run. But he's long, he's physical, he has really nice ball skills that should translate well to the league. Now, I know that the big the big talk around the town at the senior bowl was that he had a little bit of problem with his technique. He got beat a lot because when he was playing at North Carolina Central, he was able to rely on his, his athleticism and size a lot more than he could at the Senior Bowl. But that's something that can be fixed with the right coaching staff, and I think landing at the Seahawks works really, really well for him. This is a five INT guy, eight pass breakups this past season, and I think he has really, really nice speed, and he can be a factor down the line. So these are the two guys that I thought were the biggest whiffs for NFL teams, I get it. Calvin Ashley jumped around, didn't make it at Auburn, performed really, really well down there at Florida AM. But I mean, I could I, I, I saw him more as like a seventh round undrafted free agent prospect. Mac McCain, someone probably could have took a waiver on him just based on his speed. I believe he I, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I believe he ran like a four two eight at um the HBCU showcase um they had this year. So I think that was something that someone could have taken away from. We saw a lot of guys. We see it every year. People reach for speed. So you get a guy with four two eight that can make some plays. I don't see how he wasn't, you know, maybe taking a chance with in the late, late rounds. And you, know, you might say, okay, so we got this narrative, Zach. How do we fix it? Listen, uh, I'm not one for problems fixing themselves, but – in this case, I do think there needs to be a change of perception of NFL teams with HBCU guys nowadays. But I, so the thing that Deion Sanders is doing, the thing that Kondo Maynard is doing, that Eddie George is going to do, um, is they're just going to recruit too good of players to pass up on, if that makes sense. So when I look at some of the players that are going to be coming out in these next two years, there's going to be some guys that – Regardless of where they play, NFL teams are like, we have to take them. They feel a need. They're some of the best players in the draft. And so for me, I think that is what's going to really help fix this problem, at least for me. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Give me your opinion on what y'all think about this issue. But for me, I look at someone like Aquil Glass coming out of Alabama a and quarterback. I think he's too good to pass up on in the NFL draft right now. I know I've talked about his accuracy on the podcast a few times. I think that's fixable. I think he'll be okay, and I think he has enough arm talent to really, really make an impact. Also, look at Jermaine Martin out of North Carolina A&T running back. Over 1,200 yards rushing his last season, 20-plus touchdowns, and averaged almost eight yards per carry for the entire season. This kid runs like a maniac. He's physical. He's fast. He has a perfect running back size, and I think he's going to be a prospect you can see drafted. And then you look at what Jackson State has, man. Dejon Warren, Jackson State cornerback, was the number two JUCO corner coming out of of or number two corner coming out of JUCO. I think he'll be prime for a huge season next year, and will probably be one of those prospects you see taken. I, I look at Shiloh Sanders. Uh, transfer from um, South Carolina, Dion son. I think this kid was showing in the SEC. He was one of the better corners on that team. I think he can really shine once he's eligible, playing with a bunch of talented guys on that roster. He could really, really help him blow up. And I think he'll be a guy that you could see going in the, in the draft too. And then another guy who wasn't eligible, Coitus Miller. I think he was huge, huge, huge 
He's going to be huge for Jackson State at defensive tackle. He was an Auburn transfer. I know I know about this kid really well. Being an Auburn graduate, he was playing at Auburn and was recruited at Auburn while I was still going there. I really, really like this kid's potential, and I think he could be a later round guy that under Deion Sanders in that defense could really, really shine and become a late round pick. And then also, this might be a stretch, and I know I'm kind of new to this, but I really like Felix Harper, Alcorn State quarterback. I like his film. I like his leadership and intangibles that he brings, and I think he could be someone that you could see f- of, you know, land somewhere in the draft. And I think he's probably primed for a huge year, especially after Alcorn State canceled this season due to COVID. So those are some of the you know prospects. I couldn't sit here and name them all, but – I think for me, those guys out of Jackson State who come from those D1 universities are going to be too good to pass up. But also, homegrown HBCU talent like a Quill Glass is going to be too good to pass up. I know that if you're listening and you didn't, you know, you haven't been following our HBCU coverage this year, you need to get on it, man. There's been some great, 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 great. Um, coverage there, and there's been some awesome athletes that I've got to witness and cover doing this. So I think a quill glass is my guy that I think is going to break the mold, that is going to show everyone wrong, and I, there's a lot of prospects following behind him. And I like what Dion said. If we all get together, push this narrative that these kids deserve a chance, which they do, then it's going to eventually happen. And I, that's what I'm kind of meant by the problem is going to like fix itself. It's going to take us – and these coaches to be pushing the narrative that these athletes are just as good as those of power five programs, because the whole movement here is to get athletes that, that usually go to Bama that usually go to that Clemson or Auburn or Georgia or Florida or Florida state to go to HBCUs and, and, you know, engulf themselves in that type of football. So for me, I think it's only a matter of time because for me, if you're an NFL team, you're not going to pass up on a talented kid just because of where they went to school. We saw it with Titus Howard when he went first round. And I think there's a long line of athletes within the next five years that are going to break the mold. And we're going to see, we're going to look back to this episode this past weekend to say, man, can you believe no HBCU kids were drafted? Can you believe only one was drafted the last year? We're going to be looking back and saying, like, man, 12, 14, 15, 16 players from HBCUs were drafted. That's that's the goal, and I think that's where we're going to get as the recruiting, as the coaching, as the quality of player keeps rising. And I still think it's just you it's hard to break a perception. And I think that's what that's what this movement is fighting. And so I'm really, really happy to see people are speaking out on this. And so I thought I would do my part here on the Blue Bloods to cover it break down some prospects that should have been drafted and kind of give a little bit of shine to some prospects that are coming down the pipeline out of these HBCUs. But guys, if you like this episode, man, give it a huge thumbs up. It just because it's the off season for everything doesn't mean it's the off season for us. Two minute drills Monday through Friday, guys. Um, Episodes um, throughout the week as well. We're starting our pack 12 in 31 days this week. Make sure to tune into that. We got some awesome, awesome guests lined up, so make sure to tune into that. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hit 170 subscribers, man. I can't thank you enough. We're on the road to 1,000, but first we got to get to 200 so I can pick another five of y'all to get the merch bundle giveaway. We already got contact info for most of our first giveaway winners, so that merch is about to go out. Make sure to send us some pictures of y'all on the merch, man, so we can show everyone what they're missing out on. And we appreciate all the support, uh, every bit of it, man. I could, we could not do it without y'all. But for tonight, man, that is a wrap. So for myself, the two-minute drill, and the Blue Bloods, guys, we are out.